stories have been essential and, and timeless since the very beginning. I mean, they're really just events over time. That's how humans make sense of anything that we experience in life. Um, but, um, you know, whether it's photography, black and white, and then color, and then video, black and white, and then uh, high resolution screens, brighter colors, HD, 4K, and now uh, virtual reality, you know, ultimately, these different types of media are just leveraging our sensory bandwidths to a greater extent. You know, uh, I can take in all this visual information. I can hear things around me. I can smell, I can touch, I can taste. Um, and really VR is just a major step forward, I think, in uh, audiovisual bandwidth. Um, and I'm sure in the future we'll eventually have things that dynamically change shape and create scents and tastes and stuff that can recreate an experience uh, virtually without having to be there in reality. And that certainly creates the opportunity uh, for different types of, of empathy and, and learning and feeling and, and behavior and stuff like that. Nobody actually knows what these things are yet. And you have these really weird conversations with people. I was talking to somebody yesterday who was t referring to lots of different kinds of work at the same time, like just sort of hopping from work to work, and was talking about this in relation to interactive theater and how an interactive theater experience would dedicate you for like three hours. You might spend an hour just in a dark space doing nothing. And that in VR you spend five minutes, seven minutes. And I thought it was really interesting because she just dropped that and kept going. And I was like, why is VR a five to seven minute experience? And she was saying, well, it wasn't a game. I looked around and I got it and then I walked away. And I was like, is that what you expect from VR? Is that what VR should be? Is a five to seven minute experience? Does it bother you that if you think it can only last you five minutes? And that's the kind of spirit that I'm seeing around right now is people don't know. They're, they're not right sure what all of this is supposed to be yet. They haven't seen something that really like nails it down. Right? We haven't had an, ex an exemplar that's like, oh yes, this is what VR is and this is how VR works. And I think a lot of it has been wonder at the technology, but that never lasts. That's going to fade away. So like, the question is going to be, what is the form that actually makes sense here? Like, what is the structure of a piece of content that I understand when I'm in VR? I think games is one of those because games have been waiting on this for like 20 years. We've been just like been patiently bated breath waiting for us to have immersive environments. Immersive environments outside of games, we don't actually have many of those. And I don't think we have any really successful forms of those. So I don't think anybody even knows what that would look like. What's exciting right now and what I see going to a lot of these VR meetups and conferences is that people are talking about the grammar of VR. And the grammar of VR is not something I heard 20 years ago. I heard, how much can we actually see in a virtual reality thing? How many pixels do you have? What's the frame rate? You know, what, what kind of machine are you using? What's your graphics processor? And now it's like, what's your, what's your grammar for this thing? And I find that just so exciting. It's just refreshing. It means that we're getting past the technology issues and into the content. The experience that happens before you put the headset on, mm -hmm. I think is very important. And nobody's really talking about that. You know, if you think about, if you go to a movie theater, you know, walking in the movie theater and smelling the popcorn and buying your ticket changes how you experience it. Do you go, are you going into a big corporate multiplex or are you going into a local art house cinema? You know, or is it, you know, uh, or, you know, if you go to like, you go, again, theme parks, great example. Like, in the theme park, they've got the music playing while you're waiting in line to get on the ride. Mm -hmm. You know, they're getting you in the mood. Um, if, you, if you just sort of jump into something cold, you're going to have a different experience. There's a lot of research that's been done on cinematic experiences. Why do we jump when we are in a movie theater, right? Um, because we see the film as through our body as much as through our mind. And that's the crucial thing that we're always looking at. What does that mean? How can you have an experience in a VR piece that's natural? Um, what sort of things, uh, because of the technological constraints, um, both in 360 video and with computer graphics, which can be very expensive and hard to process in uh, headsets, 
Um, how do you still create a very natural storyline? Right now in the VR world, it's really like a, um, a kind of weird insect that sits between a lot of different categories. It's not a game, it's not cinema, but it's a little bit of a game, a little bit of cinema, and it's a kind of um, a very weird uh, space. I think the other, the other thing also is that it's very hard to expect what's going to be happening depending on the, the, the way how the, the wave will hit more of a global audience through um, home or consumer uh, uh, behavior like where are you going to do this? Are you going to plug it in your computer? Or like, and this I think will kind of orient also the kind of projects that will be interesting. The sense of, of, uh, of presence is really, really strong and to be able to kind of teleport people in, in mm -hmm. places for me is something I've always been fascinated as a person to travel, even in my own city, to just kind of change my way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. I think these, these headsets allow that to just kind of forget about being at some place, so there's something almost uh, mid statsive depending on the context, but there's something really uh, uh, strong about, uh, uh, about, about it. So for me, what excites me is that, that um, opportunity to bring people in, uh, in places. This word presence is, is used a lot, so I fear that I don't, when I, if I were to use the word, it has like taken on a different meaning. And I know in a technical sense that there's this idea of presence that's talked about in VR, where you have this psychosomatic feeling about what you're seeing, and it's actually that your body is in this place, like you, it's sort of this illusion, the, suspend, the deepest sense, suspension of disbelief that you're somewhere else. And I don't think Clouds was trying to do that because we were creating a space that doesn't exist. And we were essentially almost like, a, it was like a mirror turning inward into the mind. So you were creating an internal headspace. It's like you're existing within the minds of these artists for a period of time and jumping from mind to mind in a way. Um, but the, the term presence did come up for us in the, in the sense of, do you feel like the person is there with you? You know, do you feel like when you're watching uh, this person speak, is there this intimacy that's created that otherwise wouldn't be sensed or, or felt if, if it was mediated through a flat screen in a more traditional way. This time next year we're going to be having a really good conversation about VR. I, I really do think in the next year, you know, especially as a lot more of these, these technologies come to market, um, there's going to be a sea change in just who's in the game. And I think, you know, one thing that is really vital to me is that it, it is diverse and that it's actually really reflecting the, the diversity of experience and approach that we want to see in any medium and in any art form. And I think right now that's not happening, to be honest. I, I feel like it's, at the moment, it's a very male-driven sort of, um, what's the word, like, uh, platform. There don't seem to be a lot of women in it. A lot of the spaces where virtual reality is shared don't seem to be very um, diverse. And I don't just mean gender diverse, I mean age diverse, you know, people of colour, all the kind of diversity that like increasingly I am seeing as being essential to actually have a great work. Um, the work is always going to be limited if only a, a few people are playing in that um, sandbox. What's been interesting to me uh, as I've done my research into the history of, of virtual reality, I looked at the first hundred what I would call artistic experiences that were created. And I was really surprised to find that about 70% of them were either led by or chiefly designed by women. So always there's a team. These things were not simply one-offs that somebody could do, but women would come into maybe a research lab and convince the researchers there to work with her to create some vision. Uh, the Banff Institute in the early 90s had a number of people come in uh, some of the ones created by women were amazing. Shar Davies is another one who has done some absolutely stunning 
sort of very personal meditative pieces. But I was really surprised by the percentages. I think the difference might be that, that men were first of all looking at the technology, and then second of all, more in the sort of authoritative storyteller role. Whereas women, because they are sort of creatures who make a space for their children to grow into, to become their, uh, their adult selves, they're used to letting go of that authoritative voice. And I think that might be part of why they can do a different type of virtual reality experience. I think that we are absolutely at the frontier mm -hmm. um, of what we're doing, and nobody really has a very clear sense of where this is going to go. I think that storytelling in this form is going to be really interesting because I think neither game people nor film people actually understand what this space is going to be for storytelling yet. And I think it's actually going to be a collision of the two of them that's going to make this happen. We're going to see a whole new kind of storytelling art come out of this. I think adoption is a huge question about exactly what the use case is going to be that's going to make this thing be so compelling that people have to have it. But maybe if Android and iPhones get powerful enough, we'll just all have it automatically. But I think the biggest and most interesting question for me is, if we start to appreciate this as an interface for interactivity, and that's what it is, because if I can look around the room, I'm interacting. That's different than watching a movie. We have to think about that interaction as the heart of the aesthetic, and either supplement that interaction with something that's gonna make that interaction more adaptive to my entire body movement, or we have to think about what an aesthetic experience is we're choosing to look at the center of the aesthetic experience, and that's where storytelling is gonna come from. The empathy thing is very interesting because yes, you can put somebody in and, and let them see through someone else's eyes, walk a mile in their shoes or in their avatar, if you will. But one of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of empathy and the empathy machine is that I think we're in a unique position with virtual reality to create an empathy machine of the self. So we're in somewhat of a toxic environment every day, you know, bombarded by media, what we don't look good enough for, what we're not wearing, all of these things that make us feel less about ourselves. Mm -hmm. The key difference in immersive virtual reality is that you are separated from the physical world. You are in a hallowed space. We can do so much with that hallowed space to change how people feel about themselves to have them learn empathy for themselves. And I think this is an exciting area that n nobody's looking at right now. How do we get you, using virtual reality, to feel better about yourself, to understand yourself? Maybe it's a meditative thing, maybe it's a story, maybe it's a game, maybe it's a story you author while you're experiencing it. And then you come out of that, you come back to the physical world, and something's changed. And I, if we can do that, then I think VR is going to be the ultimate empathy machine. Distant glow, begging to be known.